I would like to make a few comments. I don't have to tell you things are bad. Everybody knows things are bad. We see Americans hating each other, fighting each other, killing each other at home. There is a religious war going on in this country. It is a cultural war. This war is for the soul of America. Because of the way this society is organized, you have to expect that there are going to be such explosions. Our side, our side, our side. We are a people in a quandary about the present. We are a people in search of our future. And as we see and hear these things, millions of Americans cry out in anguish. Did we come all this way for this? It all seems a long way from a time when politics was a national passion and sometimes even fun. Attempting on a larger scale to fulfill the promise of America. Three, two, one. We're met here as Americans, not as Democrats or Republicans, to solve that problem. Welcome to the Pothole Problem Podcast. I'm your host, Jack Miller, and I'm joined in the studio today by my son, Zane. And it's a very special episode today, I would think, because it's the last episode of the very first season of the pothole problem fall finale i know i'm really excited thank you for having me on for the final season i feel very honored well i appreciate you coming back to do your third interview with me i know i'm excited for it too because today sort of because of the last episode we're gonna wrap things up i was thinking we would do a bit of a looking back but also a little looking forward to the past and also the future so i'm gonna begin with i think the most fun question who was your favorite guest out of all the I don't know, about eight guests you've had. Who's your favorite? Oh, you're asking me to play favorites. Well, I mean, maybe pick a few of the top dogs. Maybe not necessarily your favorite. I have to say that, of course, I can't answer that. I can't pick my favorites because I enjoyed all of them in different ways. But I can, you know, yeah, what were some of my favorite moments? I feel like Anita was the interview that I left maybe feeling the most serene after. For sure. Darren, because he's a young man, I think there was a level of optimism that I was infused with after talking to him, though the oldest guest, Pat, also left me feeling a kind of an optimism because his long view of politics from the 1960s to the present, and yet he still remains sort of cautiously optimistic and hopeful. So at the ends of the age spectrum of the guests I had, I was left feeling this kind of cautious optimism, which I tend to have anyway, but I enjoy being able to leave an interview with my native cautious optimism reinforced. I do have to say though, okay, if I do have to pick a favorite, I'm gonna pick it as a favorite only because it is in the broader context, I essentially felt like I made a brand new friend in Rebecca Tweed, even before we sat down on the microphone, I felt like we hit it off and had a, had a big connection and we talked a bunch before the interview and we actually talked a bunch afterwards and kind of in a way had to tear each other away from ourselves because we had stuff to do and I've had lots of emails back and forth with her. So I would say that, that Rebecca is my favorite new connection for sure. She actually introduced me to Pat McCormick, who I interviewed for the previous episode. She introduced me to a state legislator, Shelley Bossart Davis, who I interviewed a couple weeks ago down in Salem, and that interview will be coming up in January. She's going to be employing some of my students as interns on the ballot measure campaign that she's going to be working on. So Rebecca is the sort of the most rich set of connections intellectually and professionally and i actually want to go watch a football game with her as well uh, at some point even though she is a dallas cowboys fan and that is not something that i'm going to become but it's something that i can tolerate very nice that's a good um that's a good benchmark right who you want to watch a football game with that's yes good that's it is good. a good benchmark and if it's somebody who i who is a cowboys fan that i would watch a football game with then that means there's a lot there in yeah. that relationship yeah i've known you for 15 years i know that's a high benchmark i got <laughs> yes, it you do all right so you were talking originally about kind of highlights and like what were some of the highlights and actually it leads me to my next question which you can take however you want my question was what have been some of your favorite answers to questions or like kind of your favorite moments like if you had to make a highlight reel of the first season what would be on that highlight reel that's a great question amanda menares gave my i think favorite 
answer to why she's no longer outraged. Uh, and in fact, I think her, maybe her source of outrage uh, was also good. Her her answer to the thing that used to outrage her was the sausage factory. You know, this is a this is kind of a standard cliche or metaphorical device in talking about politics that that the policymaking process is the sausage factory, and you don't really want to see what goes on in it. And she said that she used to be very frustrated by it because she's a policymaker and she would come to the sausage factory and watch her beautiful policy get cut up into something that seemed, you know, horrible. But not only did she learn not to be outraged by that because that's actually part of the process of bringing people together behind a policy. Policy is not just a top-down, we're the experts who know how things should be done. You have to include different people's perspectives and you have to take account of the stakeholders. The reason why that was my favorite answer is because she also went beyond that and said that she actually now has kind of flipped her outrage and sees that in fact policy is improved by going through the sausage factory. By bringing different stakeholders with different perspectives and all the interest groups that have uh, sort of an interest in a particular policy, by actually bringing them together It is not ruining the best policy. It's creating a better policy. And that was really great for me to hear because not only had she sort of flipped her outrage, but she came to a source of value in something that she had previously seen as problematic. I would say that 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 is definitely, uh, again, I don't know if I would call that my favorite answer because there were a lot of other answers that I really liked, but that's the one that stuck out to me as the most surprising to me. And the most intriguing, I guess that's why I would say I, I really liked it an awful lot. All right. So before we move on, I just, I'm just curious because like you want us to rattle off a few more favorite answers before we move on to some of the more serious sure. questions. I'm just curious. What are some other, some other moments? I also really liked Jillian's answer was interesting because her outrage was assuaged by essentially a policy victory. She was the only one who pretty much said, yeah, the way that my outrages go away, or at least the way that I can handle them, is by the world changing in a way that fits what I want it to be. And I think that that it, it was a great admission because it's one of those things where admitting that winning is what will soothe your outrage, to me, is really great. I really liked that answer because that is, I think, she said it very calmly and it wasn't like she was like i have to win in order to be able to not be outraged she just talked about how uh, her concern for access to abortions was at least here in oregon her outrage that about the difficulties of access to abortion was overcome because a policy was enacted here in oregon through a progressive legislative outcome and that calmed her so i liked that because it was kind of the other end of the spectrum from Amanda's where she came to embrace the beauty of the of the sausage factory and not just tolerate it Jillian was it was a win so there was that I also think that Anita her whole approach she never really in my mind never really fully directly answered the why her outrages have changed she talked about the process that she's undergoing to kind of address and manage the various outrages and her answer was you know self-growth and looking inward. And I really, can, I personally connect with that because I think that has been a big part of my process. But what's interesting is that I, as I reflect upon the different answers, I think that I've used a lot of the methods or techniques that people recommended at one time or another to address my own hard feelings about politics. And I think they've all been very helpful in getting me to a place where I actually can sit week after week and talk about political outrage without myself becoming super outraged that's actually perfect you don't even know because the next question was going to be how have you changed your mind or been brought to a new perspective because of an episode so you kind of perfectly segued into that question so i was wondering like you kind of talked about it before but like what is some new perspective or viewpoint change that has happened because of the season so far right i think that one of the things i realized is that addressing outrage is a multi-front endeavor call it a battle it's a multi-front battle different approaches are necessary there's not one panacea there's not one thing like you know darren's i remember his was you know don't bring your emotion to a fight and he was talking about how he's outraged by certain things in the world particularly wealth inequality and institutionalized racism totally legitimate forms of outrage and he's not giving up his outrage he's just not bringing it on the outside he's keeping it inside as a motivator 
I think that's a great piece of advice and, and a great technique. Other people have talked about essentially learning about how the world works, greater understanding helps to mitigate their outrage, that you go deeply into a question and find out, okay, here's this thing that makes you crazy. Well, why is it like that? You know, Misha talked about gentrification and how that, that's definitely a source of outrage here in Portland. For him, he is not necessarily saying, well, gentrification is just going to happen, so I have to just suck it up and, and, and deal with it. He was saying that understanding that it's a force and that it's not personal and that you can't stop it, you can only channel it or address it, he deepened his understanding of something that he had a problem with. That was also another good technique. So I think that what I've learned from doing all these different interviews is that there's not one piece of advice. There's not one approach. There is a set and we could all benefit from having a variety of tools for addressing our hard feelings about politics, for when we feel like, you know, we're never going to win or something is it a problem that needs to be addressed and it's not being addressed, you know, gun violence or climate change or negative health outcomes. And it's not happening fast enough that the, there's so many ways that outrage come at us that it's useful to have a variety of tools for dealing with it as a multi-front war. So for me, that has been my, I would say my biggest takeaway so far from this season. You're listening to the Pothole Problem podcast created by White Tiger Productions. At White Tiger Productions, we create experiences. If you have an idea for a podcast, a workshop, or a show of any kind, we'll help you go from concept to execution. We provide creative direction and production support. We've got a podcast studio, writers and storytellers, sound engineers and editors, designers, videographers, hosts, creative coaches, everything you need to manifest your creative potential. You name it or even vaguely describe it, and we'll take you from dream to finished product. White Tiger Productions. You can do what you think, and we can help you. Visit us at youcandowhatyouthink.com and tell us what you're thinking about. So now we're going on to a little bit of a more lighthearted topic. You have an email address, and some people sent you emails. I might want to do a whole episode reading listener emails, but I'm curious right now. Have you, have, have you gotten any listener emails that are stand out or that were interesting to you or that you, I don't know, that were stuck in your head maybe? My favorite listener email comes from my sister-in-law, Krista Emerson, listening in Worcester, Ohio. She is a big fan of podcasts and she has some super favorites and I'm not going to name those favorites. She told me that my podcast replaced her normal morning run podcast and that she really was thankful for that and that she really got a lot out of it. And I thought, oh, if I could bump somebody else's preferred running podcast, that makes me feel like I've done something very successful. Now, it's, that's my sister-in-law, of course, so there's a family connection. But I have heard from other people who've actually listened to my podcast when they're running that it is, in fact, a good running podcast. So I've gotten a few emails to that effect. That actually, I don't know why I myself would never listen to a podcast while running uh, (laughs) because I'm too distracted by how much I hate to be running that I can't focus on anything that's happening. So that's not something I share the desire to do, but I really appreciate that. That's good. I'm going to make a call out to all the listeners of this podcast, any future listeners of this podcast. It's the end of the season. We've got a break. I want to see those listener emails. I want to do the listener emails episode. I want to convince my dad there's enough emails that's worth an episode. I really want this to happen make a little boy's dream come true jack.miller at pdx.edu is how you reach my inbox and yeah make a little boy's dream come true <laughs> that's uh, in. you're really playing the little boy card the fact is is that you are nearly as tall as i am <laughs> and i'm not sure the little boy thing counts as an appeal yeah, anymore well but i would like those listener emails yes but now, I, I would like them as well so one of the things about running a podcast there's a certain level of fame that goes that you might be recognized or you might be noticed and i just wondered Another kind of silly question, if there are any recognition stories or any kind of someone meeting you in real life who was like, I listen to your podcast, I like it, or something something like that, or some interesting stories like that. That has not happened to me yet. Part of it is that they don't know what I look like. I do, however, have a decent number of listeners among my current students. And so I've had students who have said to me, like, hey, I really like your podcast, or I'm listening to your podcast, or then they actually refer to something deep in one of the episodes as though they want to prove to me that they actually did listen to it. Here's, I will tell you this, and potentially embarrassing you, almost every one of my students who has remarked on the podcast has said, your son is such a good interviewer, he's so poised. So the fame is largely yours. It's not mine so far. And as a proud father, I'm happy about that. As the host of the show, I'm a little chagrined. <laughs> I was right. I was going to say. 
I think that maybe people don't want to praise me too much to my face, but I also think that maybe you're the most surprising breakout of the first season so far. Maybe, yeah. I suppose I never really thought about it. It certainly is enjoyable to do this. Well, you are a very good interviewer, and I appreciate what you are able to interview out of me. Maybe I'm going to have to let you interview some of the other guests at some point as a kind of an internship. The intern Zane interviews, I don't know. We'll have to find out who's All right, one of the major coming. leagues, I see. Yeah, All right, well, so that's stay how much, tuned. Stay tuned, ladies and gentlemen. That's how much I trust you. All right, so we've kind of wrapped it to the end. So I just wanted to say, give you a more general question. So on the whole, how do you think the first season has gone? I'm very pleased with it, and I'm very proud that... I've produced something that I think is doing what I hoped it would do. That is looking at a hard subject, political outrage, negative feelings generated by the political system in general. We are living in a time where there's a lot of emotion and the emotion tends to be powerful and negative. And I think that it's totally understandable why there is all this powerful negative emotion happening. But I also think that there's a hunger for a way to address it. Instead of just spiraling into ever more rage and frustration and anger and all of the sort of associated movements of partisanship and tribalism that go along with that, instead of succumbing to it, I think there's really a hunger for a way to address this in a healthier way. Most people I talk to understand that our political discourse is like a bad diet. Not a diet where you're trying to lose weight, but a diet what you eat. That Our political discourse is junk food that is hard to avoid, but is ultimately unhealthy and unsatisfying. And not to aggrandize myself too much, but I feel like I'm introducing some healthy food into the cuisine of our political discourse because it's, that was my intention initially. And I feel like the guests that I've talked to and then the feedback I've gotten from listeners makes me feel like I am moving in that direction. And it, not only makes me proud to think that I'm doing something that could be potentially beneficial for our political discourse, it inspires me to keep doing it and to try to get better so that I can achieve some kind of increase in serenity, if that's possible. That is one of my goals. And so I feel like I've moved the needle at least a little bit. That's actually one of the other things I've heard in emails is people saying, it actually has left me serene in, at times when it was really necessary. You know, there's all kinds of stuff going on in the news cycle. That will never stop. If I can introduce a little serenity into the world, uh, then that will make me very happy. I like that metaphor of like a healthy food in political discourse. You should make that the subtitle, the pothole problem, the salad of political discourse. Oh, yeah. See, that's, I think that's not good for the brand oh. the because people don't like a salad. Like, so we're having a, a vegetarian bowl tonight for dinner. Does that excite you? Okay, I see your point now. Yeah, if I told I you that it. I was making you hamburgers for dinner tonight, you would be very pleased. <laughs> yes, I yeah. would be happy. Okay. So I want to provide the healthy meal without necessarily saying it in that way, though now I have. And so I'm out. So we'll, I see. we're going to edit out all this part okay. about the salad. That's what I figure. Right. <laughs> we'll cut it. All right. So we've looked to the past, but I allude to we're going to look to the future, and that's what we're doing right now. So I'm just going to ask you, what do you see slash what do you hope for the future of the podcast? Well, you know, in the short term, next season, the winter season, I'm turning to interviewing uh, elected officials. We have not had anybody on the podcast so far who has held public office. Uh, We've had people who are strategists and campaign advisors. We have people who are hopefuls for the future to run for office. But we've not had anybody who has gone through a successful campaign and held office. So that's what I'm turning towards in the winter. But sort of going forward, what I'm hoping to do is to continue getting different perspectives on how people handle their own outrage and the outrage of others so that I can increase this toolkit of ways to approach it for ourselves. So, you know, really the future, I'm going to just try to keep doing what I've been doing and broadening the perspectives with every new guest. I'm hoping that a new tool will be made available to the listeners to put into their arsenal of this war. Now I'm mixing my metaphors, but that's a common thing for me, for anybody who knows me. So that's the future. I'm going to keep doing it once a week during the PSU term. So there'll be a winter 11-week season. There's going to be a spring 11-week season. Then I'm going to take the summer off and use that time to really say, okay, what is year two going to look like? What would be the best use of this medium to advance my goals and maybe add some goals there's going to be a reassessment 
but I, I feel confident that going into year two, I'm going to not be reversing direction, but I'm going to be building off of what's been happening so far. Very nice. All right. So we've got the past, we've got the future. And before we close, I'm just going to ask you, is there anything else you want to say? Any final remarks? Final remarks are that I am really grateful that people have opened themselves up to me. And I have had little difficulty in lining up interviews with people who are busy and have many things going in the world and that they gave me their time to contribute to the endeavor that I'm engaged in. So I'm, I'm just really grateful to everybody who has done that. And I'm, I am going to be grateful in advance to everybody who is going to do that in the future. Thanks to all of you. And of course, thanks to all the listeners for going along on this ride with me and on being part of this effort to expand the existence of serenity, to maybe help, however incrementally, improve the health of our political discourse and improve their own psychological health by not getting rid of their negative emotions, because I'm not asking anybody to get rid of them, but to be able to understand them and manage them and, and work with them in a way that is not destructive to their own mental health and not destructive to the political discourse in general, but to be positive and healthy in some way. All right, and that is the final episode of the first season of The Pothole Problem. Thank you, Dad, for having me on. It was a pleasure to interview you. It was a pleasure having you interview me. I will see you and the listeners back in January for the next season. Hopefully, I'll be able to do more episodes. Oh, you definitely will. But for now, I'm Zane. And I'm Jack Miller. Thanks for listening. To end this episode is a song by a band that I am part of. My wife and I are sometimes known as The Born Losers, and this song is called The Trouble Song. It was recorded live right here in the White Tiger studio 11 years ago in 2008. Thank you for listening. We are the Born Losers, and we're here to lower the bar. <laughs> yes! Yeah.
know, posing and flirting, flirting and joking and forgetting my wife. Oh, 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 Stupid trouble often starts out as fun. It's just how it goes, I guess. It's just how it goes, I guess. It's just how it goes, I guess. I guess. I guess. <laughs> Listening to the Pothole Problem Podcast with Jack Miller. Keep up the good work.